Hello, AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School. And we're going to start with a little bit of an introduction over our next topic, 5.2, which is all about the extreme value theorem, which is our third of our big three theorems that we see in Calculus AB, Intermediate Value Theorem, Mean Value Theorem, and Extreme Value Theorem. But there are a lot of other ideas that are kind of meshed in with this particular topic that sets the stage for the rest of the things that you're going to learn all throughout Unit 5. So I'd like to take a, a look at just laying the groundwork at a few of those things right now and then end with a, a short multiple choice example. So 5.2, all about extrema of a function. And it says here initially that in calculus, a lot of effort is going to be devoted into determining the behavior behavior of a function on some interval. So some of the questions that we're going to be interested in asking is, does the function f have a maximum value on that interval, or does it have a minimum value? When is that function increasing? When is that function decreasing? These are just a few of the things that are going to start coming your way with the many of the problems that you're going to be seeing. And so we're going to use the derivative to be able to answer these very questions. Now, let's talk a little bit about Extrema. Extrema is a is a fancy plural word that means the extreme values. That would be the overall highest point and the overall lowest points that you might see in a function. And I want you to know that a function does not always have to have a maximum um, or a minimum. So if you see the picture here below, we have this uh, parabolic curve, uh, x squared plus 1, that's really just defined between negative 1 and 2. But in some cases, we do define the endpoints, and in some cases we might define um, the uh, uh, neither of the endpoints, um, or in the figure 3, we define the endpoints, but we open up an interval. Uh, we open up a circle on that interval. And I know that it might be a little bit tough to see in the picture, but I'm going to describe what's happening here. In figure 1, we have the curve that does exist at the two endpoints, no discontinuities in between. And if that is the case, you certainly can say that there is a minimum value, that would be down here, and there is a maximum value, that would be that point up here. However, if we were to open up the endpoints and define this only on the open interval negative 1 to 2, then we could say that this function would only have a minimum on that interval because we can't reach this maximum because we can just get closer and closer and closer to that open circle. Likewise, if we open up this bottom circle, this vertex, and say that the function's not defined there, and then still go ahead and define it at the endpoints, then we have a situation where we have a maximum, but we do not have a minimum value because we can't get to a point that's the overall lowest point. So the following theorem is a result of the situation to the left, and it's uh, it's a big one, the extreme value theorem. It says that the function f, if it's continuous on a closed interval a to b, then f has to have both a maximum and a minimum value on the interval. And that's indicative there in figure 1. Now, we have some geographical examples of extreme, and I like to use this with my students to kind of get them comfortable with the difference between uh, overall extrema and local extrema. So for example, let's say that we've got Mount Everest in Nepal. That is the overall highest point on the planet. It's 29,000 feet above sea level. However, let's say that you are in the United States. There's also a very high point in the United States. That's Mount Denali in Alaska. It used to be Mount McKinley. And it's just a mere 20,000 feet high. Well, we don't want to discount the fact that Denali, Alaska is a very high point, but it's not the overall highest point on the Earth. So sometimes we could think of Denali, Alaska as being a relative maximum, relative, say, to the United States. It's the highest point in the U.S., highest point in North America. But Mount Everest would be an absolute or global maximum because it's the highest point overall in the world. And so you have two different kinds of maximums, a relative or local versus an absolute or global that we'll have to deal with throughout this particular unit. Same thing can be said about minimums. Um, we, we have the overall minimum 
value on Earth, that would be the Mariana Trench on the Pacific Ocean, 36,000 feet below sea level. Now, if you're thinking, well, that doesn't count because it's in the middle of the ocean, then we could say maybe the Dead Sea in Jordan, which is really kind of a land feature in its just 1400 feet below sea level. So depending on how you want to define what the overall lowest point is, whether it's uh, in the ocean or not. But then in the United States, we have a very low point in California called Death Valley. That's 282 feet below the sea level. So Death Valley would be like the local or relative minimum and the Mariana Trench or the Dead Sea, depending on how you want to view it, could be the global minimum. In the second page here, we talk about relative extrema and critical numbers. And I've given you a graph, it's a cubic graph, x cubed minus 2x squared to the right. And I say that it has a relative maximum at the point 0, 0, and a relative minimum at the point 2, negative 4. And those are two facts. We're going to call these relative minimum because the fact that this graph is considered defined on the entire interval. That means that this little piece here is going to continue to go downward. This part here is going to continue to go upward. And thus, we're not going to really ever be able to determine what the overall max or min is. But we can certainly say that this is our Denali right here, and this might be our Death Valley. There are our relative extrema. Think of uh, the maximum as like a peak of a mountain, and the minimum as being like the valley. Now, each of these relative extrema it's really important to note has the feature that the derivative of the function is either zero or does not exist. In this case, the derivatives of these positions are zero because they're nice smooth curves. That is so important because that introduces the idea of the critical number. And critical numbers are so important because that's where things start to happen with our functions. So if we let f be defined at some value c, if the derivative of f at c is 0, or if f is not differentiable at that c, then we call c a critical number. And that ties into the definition of our relative extrema. If f is a function whose second derivative exists on an open interval i, then there is an open interval containing c on which f of c is a maximum. If that's true, then f of c is going to be the relative max. If there's an open interval containing c on which f of c is a minimum, then we call f of c the relative minimum. And as I said before, the plural of, of these words look a little different. The plural of maximum is maxima. The plural of minimum is typically minima. And here's an example of graphically of uh, critical numbers, c. In the first case, you have your c. That's the position where the derivative does not exist. And in the second graph, you have your derivative at c equal to 0. And then notice in both of those cases, the possibility exists to have an extrema. In this particular case, that extrema happened to be a relative maximum. Now, I don't want you to think that every time the derivative is 0 or every time the derivative is not defined, you have a maximum or a minimum because that's not necessarily true. However, in order to be a maximum or minimum, you must first be a critical number. And that's what this little definition states. If f has a relative minimum or a relative maximum, then c has to be a critical number if that max or min occurs at c. I know a lot of preliminary information going on. Let's go ahead and end the video. We'll just run through a, a pretty short example here. It's a very conceptual based question, uh, multiple choice. And these can be a little bit tricky sometimes. They really require the students to read very, very meticulously. It says, if f is continuous for a closed interval a, b, and differentiable on an open interval a, b, which of the following could be? And the key word here is false. Part a, the derivative of f at c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a for some c on the open interval a to b. Well, if you look at this pretty closely, you're going to see that this resembles a theorem that we learned not too long ago. In fact, it was the very last topic, 5.1. And this is indeed the mean value theorem. And we know it to be true if the conditions in the stem of this question are met. So there is no way that that one could be false. We know that that must be true. All right, so we'll just say 
true here after the fact. Okay, f prime of c is equal to zero for some c on the open interval a to b. So if you've got a function that's continuous and differentiable, then you must have a derivative that's equal to c. Well, sometimes the best way to go about answering these kinds of questions are to refute them with a counterexample. So can you draw a graph, let's say, uh, that might have a derivative that's not equal to zero? Well, the only thing that you have to make sure of is that your graph is always continuous and it's always differentiable. So no holes, breaks, or asymptotes, no sharp turns. So maybe you draw something that looks like this. This is a graph that certainly would be continuous on a closed interval a to b. It looks like it's differentiable in the open. Is there a place that looks like the derivative is equal to zero there, though? Not the way that I've drawn it. In fact, this, this graph is always increasing, which you're going to learn very soon that that means that the derivative is always positive, no matter where you decide to take it. So I'm looking at b as possibly being this answer. Now, if I move on to c and d, the connections that I hope the, that we make here is the fact that this relates to the theorem that we just talked about. This is the extreme value theorem. And of course, this always has to be true. And the stipulation was that you had a function that was continuous on a, on a closed interval, was its only stipulation. And so we can even see from my picture that I drew for b that we certainly have a maximum value and we certainly have a minimum value. And so we are going to go with b. Some students really struggle with these kinds of questions. So we've got a couple of more in a couple of very short videos that are going to follow up with this one. And I really want you to start thinking about uh, visualizing what each of the four answer choices are trying to convey. And the best way to tackle these is to draw a graph that can refute the information that's presented in a particular problem that asks you if something is true or false. Anyway, I hope this helps and we'll see you next time.